When the mainstream press and the government says nobody could have predicted this, they're lying through their fucking teeth. Turning to some other top stories, manager of the crippled Fukushima nuclear plant in Japan admits all efforts to contain radiation leakage have failed. This despite claims by the country's prime minister eight months ago that the issue had been resolved. Robert Jacobs from the Hiroshima Peace Institute explains what the situation is like at Fukushima at the moment. The levels at the plant and the levels in the area around it are somewhat stabilized. It's, it's too high for people to live. It's too high for people to return to. But the amount entering the sea is what's ongoing. Uh, that's ongoing every day. Tons of water, enter, contaminated water enters the sea. So that's not changing the amount of radiation that's nearby in the land or areas that were contaminated from the explosions. However, um, there will be, for the foreseeable future, this ceaseless entry of uh, radioactive water into the ocean. As the government and plant operator TEPCO try to persuade the public they're in control of the situation, some events indicate it could be the opposite. These are just some of the local headlines that not only suggest a worsening of contamination, but also a sharp drop in trust of officials. Jacobs thinks there's reason to be skeptical. There have been quite a lot of lies told by TEPCO, the company that owns these plants, uh, who denied that there were meltdown, any meltdowns at all for almost three months when they knew uh, by the end of the first day that they had uh, nuclear core meltdowns happening. So they've, you know, they've certainly been uh, absolutely happy to lie in. More on how Japan, Japan is dealing with the aftermath of the disaster on our website, rt.com. Leaders of a town in Fukushima are considering whether to go back home. People were forced to evacuate Naraha after the earthquake and tsunami crippled a nuclear plant three years ago. But many residents are still not sure if their town is safe. Most of the town is within 20 kilometers of Fukushima Daiichi. And the area is still in the government-designated evacuation zone. Town officials held a meeting in neighboring Iwaki City to discuss a possible return. 80% of Naraha's residents are staying there. Residents learned that workers have finished removing radioactive material from residential areas in the town. Officials explained that radiation has dropped by half from pre-decontamination levels. And a municipal panel of experts has judged the town livable. They also say a makeshift shopping mall has been built but many residents are wary. We're mostly concerned about the exact radiation level. Give us more details. Please don't rush. Make a careful decision. Naraha's mayor says he wants to hear from more residents and assembly members before deciding when they should start returning. Power companies are learning from the Fukushima Daiichi disaster and stepping up safety measures against the possible earthquakes and tsunami. The research institute now has a new facility that can create artificial tsunami waves to test the safety of nuclear power plants. The new facility is located at the Central Research Institute of Electric Power Industry near Tokyo. It has a water pool 20 meters long and 4 meters wide. It generates waves that can travel as fast as 7 meters per second, the speed of the tsunami that devastated northeastern Japan in March 2011. It can also create continuous waves as high as 2 meters for 3 minutes and simulate various wave shapes. It's important to verify to what extent nuclear power plants can withstand a tsunami. Clarifying that process will lead to a higher level of security in the plants. Researchers will also test several types of breakwaters and study the force generated when uh, objects drifting in a tsunami collide. Evacuation towers have been built in a coastal city in Kochi Prefecture, western Japan. Nankoku City residents can use the 14 towers if a mega quake occurs along the Nankai Trough in the Pacific Ocean.
city officials started building the towers in July last year. They've been spaced at intervals of about 600 meters. Residents can reach the closest one in about five minutes on foot. Experts estimate tsunami waves could reach the city in about 20 minutes at the earliest after a major quake. Some residents climbed up to one of the two-story towers to see inside. Nankoku city officials said the towers are equipped with stairs, slopes and warning bells. All of the towers can house nearly 4,500 evacuees. Before these were built, we had no place to evacuate. I now feel at ease. She also said she will take part in drills to practice making her way to the tower when a future earthquake strikes. Tourism used to be one of the most lucrative industries along Japan's northeastern coast, but after the 2011 disaster, the visitors stopped coming. People in the industry have struggled to bring them back. They're doing everything they can to change the situation. A steam locomotive runs through the hills of Iwate Prefecture. The train was brought back into operation earlier this month. 42 years after it was retired. East Japan Railway decided to resume the service to help lure back tourists. Company officials plan to operate the train about 80 times a year on holidays and weekends. The steam locomotive is already a success. People are flocking to Kamaishi Station to see and ride on this piece of history. Authorities expect as many as 20,000 people will eventually take the train each year. We hope tourists will come to Kamaishi, stay overnight, and enjoy our delicious locally made sake. But there's a major obstacle to revitalizing the tourism industry here. There just aren't enough rooms to accommodate a large number of visitors. More than two and a half million people used to visit the nearby city of Kestinuma each year before the earthquake. Tourism was a key industry, but the number of visitors plunged after the disaster to about a million last year. The city's hotels and inns can accommodate about 3,000 people, but many rooms are occupied by workers who've moved to the area to help with reconstruction. At times, Construction workers take up about 80% of the rooms. Even if tourists want to visit Kesenuma, finding a place to stay can be difficult. Many guests at this hotel said they couldn't relax because of all the construction workers, so the hotel changed its policy. The management decided to prioritize tourists over the steady stream of construction workers. They reasoned that the construction work will one day be over and they want the tourists to keep on coming. Over the long term, we didn't want a situation where sightseers didn't enjoy their stay. So we decided to gradually change the type of guest. This tour bus company used to offer a special weekend package that included accommodation. But it had to discontinue the offer because of the shortage of hotel rooms. The number of people signing up dropped around 80 percent. Tourism is the lifeblood of the local economy. If the tourists don't return, many other businesses will also see their sales dry up. We want visitors to stay overnight and buy our products when they go home. To help regain the city's status as a top tourist destination, officials in Kesenuma are trying to get the area designated as a special tourism zone, where businesses would be eligible for tax breaks. They're also planning to help build some 300 hotels, restaurants and other facilities to boost tourism. The city has opened a tourist information center and is offering updated information on its website about hotels, inns, and other tourist facilities that are back in business. The reconstruction-related demand will cool down eventually, and tourists will become the main customer. 
By then, we want to make the city more attractive, so more people will come. The Tohoku region has long been popular among people in search of delicious seafood and beautiful scenery. The 2011 disaster may have dealt a harsh blow, but the area has a history of overcoming difficulties. And people here are determined to once again make it a place where tourists Tourist want to go. to a town in northeastern Japan to see a thousand-year-old cherry tree that is now in full bloom. The tree, designated as a national natural treasure, is drawing people to Miharu town in Fukushima prefecture. The tree's sprawling branches are heavy with flowers, with pink petals hanging in a cascade. So great! It's breathtakingly beautiful. <laughs> I can feel the tree's history here. It looks exactly like a waterfall. The cherry tree used to draw more than 300,000 tourists each year, but the number dropped to almost half just after the earthquake and tsunami three years ago. Now, tourists are gradually returning. Town officials expect the number of visitors this year to exceed the figures for the last two years. A record trade deficit for fiscal year 2013, which ended in March. Analysts say the weaker yen and an increase in fuel imports are behind the increase. Finance Ministry officials say that Japan's trade deficit rose to about $134 billion for the fiscal year that ended last month. This marked a third consecutive year of deficits. The figure is the largest since comparable data became available back in 1979. Exports rose more than 10 percent in yen terms last fiscal year. Imports rose more than 17 percent. In addition to the weaker yen, higher demand for fuel for thermal power generation contributed to the red ink. The finance ministry also said the deficit in the month of March came to about $14 billion. The country's imports exceeded exports for the 21st month in a row. Now, officials at Japan's industry ministry have high hopes for methane hydrate. They see it as a promising source of energy. So they're planning a survey to check for reserves of the substance under the Sea of Japan. Last March, government researchers succeeded in extracting natural gas from a methane hydrate deposit in the Pacific Ocean seabed. It was the first time anyone had been able to do that. Now they have their sights set on the other side of Japan. They're planning to drill the seabed and take samples to determine the amount of reserves. Ministry officials say they'll conduct the survey from June until March next year. And they'll try to improve the technology for extracting gas. Police in Tokyo are tightening security. They're getting ready for the arrival of U.S. President Barack Obama. The president's coming to Japan at the start of a tour of Asia. He'll be here as a state guest from Wednesday through Friday. The Metropolitan Police are taking no chances with Obama's safety. They've mobilized 16,000 officers. That's a third of their force. Obama will arrive at Haneda Airport. Police on patrol there are looking out for suspicious people or objects. Staff sealed trash cans and coin-operated lockers. I've looked all over, but I can't find anywhere to throw my rubbish. Obama will talk Thursday with Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. They'll meet at the state guest house. Riot police are standing guard outside and operating checkpoints. Staff at Tokyo Station sealed more than 5,000 lockers. I just arrived in Tokyo. Not being able to use a locker is a nuisance. Obama will fly out on Friday. He'll be heading to South Korea. Obama is trying to show his so-called pivot to Asia is still in his playbook. He'll meet with Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe to talk about everything from trade to security to regional relations. NHK World's Masayoshi Tanaka has more from Washington. President Obama plans to visit four Asian countries, Japan, then South Korea, Malaysia, and the Philippines. During his time in Tokyo, He'll be the first U.S. president to be welcomed as a state guest since Bill Clinton in 1996.
Three years ago, Obama said he would boost U.S. engagement in the region. The policy became known as the pivot to Asia. The United States is turning our attention to the vast potential of the Asia-Pacific region. Since then, his administration has juggled crises in the Middle East, Africa, and Eastern Europe. And last year, the government shutdown forced him to pull out of two major conferences in Asia. Michael Green was senior director of Asia on the National Security Council and the former President George W. Bush. He says there is a lot riding on this trip. Their overall objective is to demonstrate that the uh, so-called pivot or rebalance to Asia is still very much alive. Uh, remember, President Obama canceled his visit to Asia last October for APEC and the East Asia Summit because of budget uh, politics in the Congress. So he needs to make up for that. Obama would be in Asia at a time of heightened regional tensions. The Chinese military has been asserting itself at sea, causing concern in Japan, the Philippines, and other nations. Relations between Japanese and South Korean leaders have become strained too. Obama had to organize a three-way summit last month to get Prime Minister Abe and President Park to officially meet face-to-face -face for the first time. Green says the U.S. position in Asia is very weak when Japan and South Korea are at odds. These are our two most important allies with democratic values, the host of most of our military forces. And uh, it hurts us because North Korea thinks that um, the democracies and the regional powers can't come together to punish them. It also sends a message to China. Green says leaders in Beijing may envision an Asia centered on the nation where they can pull South Korea or other countries away from Japan and the U.S. He stresses it's crucial for Obama and Abe to strengthen the decade-old alliance that binds their nations. The president himself, I suspect, has learned the nature of the Chinese regime, the need for cooperation, but the fact that Chinese understand power. And when the Americans talk about power, what have we got? Our economy, our military, and our alliances. So he'll want to show that this alliance is strong. Coming to Asia will help President Obama do that. His administration will send additional naval destroyers to Japan. The message seems to be clear. The U.S. is determined to maintain its presence in the region. Masayoshi Tanaka, NHK World. A South Washington. Korean publisher is hoping to do its part to help improve relations between Japan and South Korea. It's launched a Japanese language newspaper based in Tokyo. The editors want to offer readers insight into the two countries and promote better understanding. NHK World's Masaya Fujimoto reports. This monthly free paper is published by the Korean newspaper Seoul Shimun Daily. Called Tessero, it is written in Japanese and covers Korean politics, business, and culture. It was launched in Tokyo last November. The paper is edited by the Tokyo Bureau of Seoul Shimun. Against the difficult ties between the two countries, the editors want the publication to promote understanding. I want to provide readers with information that's accurate. I hope that as a result, the understanding between our two countries deepens. Kim min is Seoul Shimbun's Tokyo correspondent. On this day, she heads to Fukushima City. She wants to write about the aftermath of the nuclear disaster. Her aim is to describe conditions in the region. She also wants to share with the Japanese readers her personal impressions of her first visit to Fukushima. I've come here to find out how the people in this area are surviving. I want to write about how they feel three years after the disaster. 
Kim visit Chan Hyung Shil. She has lived here for 14 years. She teaches at a Korean language school and runs a cafe. Despite the ongoing nuclear disaster, she has chosen to stay in the city. Chan says most Korean media coverage of Fukushima focuses on contaminated water and radioactivity. Some Koreans believe that in the next couple of years, 400,000 people will die of cancer. It's a bit extreme. I agree. That's why I want to gather information firsthand, so I can provide accurate news to South Korean readers. Yes, we really need that. Kim also visited the language class and talked to some students there. There's nothing we can do about radiation. It just falls from the sky. You can't tell your children to avoid something that is all around you like that. Kim says she has realized how deeply the disaster scarred people there and wants to share with her Japanese readers what she saw and felt. I hope our articles can help relations between our two countries. With their publication, Kim and her colleagues want to show Japanese readers how fair and candid reporting can promote better understanding. Masaya Fujimoto, NHK World, Tokyo. South Korean defense officials say North Korea may be preparing for another nuclear test. A spokesperson for the defense ministry says there have been signs of increased activity at a test site. South Korean military leaders are increasing their surveillance. Defense Ministry spokesperson Kim min Suk said the North Koreans could conduct a nuclear test soon at the Pungeri test site. Authorities in Pyongyang have already carried out three tests at the same facility in the country's northeast. But the spokesperson said a test isn't a foregone conclusion. He said North Korean officials have faked preparations in the past. Despite pressure from the West, the UN nuclear watchdog, the IAEA, says Iran is already acting to cut its most sensitive nuclear stockpile by almost 70%. But socialist activist Caleb Maupin thinks Washington is playing political games and adding to the discord. Iran has opened a hand of friendship and diplomacy to the United States. But the response of the U.S. and Israel to Iran's call for peace and negotiations has been aggression. And that's what we're seeing with this, you know, this building seizure, the, the attacks on the, the new U.N. ambassador. The work of the federal, uh, the federal prosecuting institutions, uh, the FBI and others, is very political and is often very politically motivated. It's very clear that certain interests in the United States, whether they be the big oil corporations, whether they be certain Wall Street banking institutions, Institutions, and specifically, you know, the, the Israeli and the Zionist uh, entities, they are c clearly devoted to attacking Iran. The U.S. wants that oil for, for, for Shell and other U.S. corporations, it, it, and that's, that's, that's unacceptable, but that's, 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 that's motivated all this hostility and aggression. The Earth have long scanned the skies in search of planets that could support life. And now scientists at the U.S. Space Agency have spotted an Earth-sized planet that may feature a key necessity, surface water in liquid form. The NASA astronomers discovered the planet using the Kepler Space Telescope. They dubbed it Kepler 186F. It's about 500 light years from Earth in the constellation Cygnus. The planet is about 10% larger than Earth. The astronomers say its orbit around its sun falls within the habitable zone in which liquid water might pool on the surface of an orbiting planet. This is one of the big uh, milestones that we've been looking for in our in our attempts to find out if there are places just like home and if there's life out there. The planet's host star is smaller and cooler than the Sun and not as bright. NASA researchers say they will keep looking for planets that are more similar to Earth. Well, that was it. It's all downhill from here, bud. Oh yeah, go on, click the subscribe button. We need to get subscribed and get this unity stronger and beat YouTube at their own game. Okay, that's what this is about. Like I say, go to the remix button, hit the remix button. That way you'll have this video and, and keep up with this. Otherwise, you know, YouTube's just going to control us, guys, and it's, it's really bad.